welcome to another episode of the Liberator Podcast. I'm here with James Silberman. I'm Sam Riley. And we're here to discuss almost the first bill, maybe not the first, but pretty much one of the first bills that the pro-life movement has actually unveiled um, that they're going to be pursuing uh, after the overturn of Roe has been right. decided. Yeah. Um, and it's... Not good. <laughs> it's not good. Yeah. It is It is more wild than I was expecting they'd, they'd even pursue something. I, I did not think they would pursue something like this. So this is in Indiana. Yep. Um, this is uh, a, a bill by uh, Representative Glick. Yep. Sue Glick. Uh, Sue Glick. And she is a pro-life hero. Yep. Um, she was endorsed for that seat by Indiana Right to Life. Um, she has been on different pro-life legislation and has been put through Indiana in the past. So this is a pro-life legislator uh, who is showing us what the Indiana pro-life politicians want to do without Roe versus Wade in the way. So they can no longer, or without Roe versus Wade purportedly in the way. So they can no longer pretend their hands are tied. They're just coming out and saying, you know, this is completely in our hands. The Supreme Court is now saying this is completely in our hands. We can do whatever we want. Here's what we want. This is the type of legislation that we want in the state of Indiana. And again, this is written by... And sponsored by representative or by state senator Sue Glick, yeah. endorsed by Indiana Right to Life. Mm-hmm. So let's get into this bill, um, which State Representative John Jacob refers to as bonkers, um, and we'll get to see why why he labeled it that. Um, so right here in section one of the bill, they're actually creating a right to a new type type of abortion that doesn't currently exist in Indiana state law. So they're basically saying abortion means the termination of a human pregnancy with the intention, with an intention other than to produce a live birth, remove a dead fetus, or three, terminate a pregnancy where the fetus suffers from an irremediable medical condition that is incompatible with sustained life outside the womb, regardless of when the child is born. So basically saying if there's a, a diagnosis that the child has some sort of um, some sort of disease, some sort of disability, whatever it be, and they're basically saying incompatible with life, so the child may, may not or will not survive for very long um, outside the womb, you can go ahead and murder the child inside the womb. Mm. Um, that is that is what this is saying. Um, the, the logic here, again, it's, it's no different than if we're saying, you know, if there's, a, if there's a, an adult who has some sort of disease or if they have cancer or something else, you can go ahead and you can stab that adult in the neck. Right. Yeah. That, that's what you, just because someone has a disease or something doesn't mean you can go kill them. And this is made especially bad by the fact that a lot of these irremediable medical conditions um, are, are falsely diagnosed. Right. There's lots and lots of false diagnoses of these sorts of things. Yeah. Um, where Russell Hunter, Russell Hunter's <clears throat> son was diagnosed with spina bifida in the womb. I believe Jeff Durbin's son as well was diagnosed with spina bifida inside the womb, mm-hmm. right? And these sorts of things. Um, now, spina, I'm not sure spina bifida would have would have uh, counted for this, but those sorts of things are misdiagnosed all the time. Well, so both of them were recommended for abortion. Yeah. So, yeah. And and in case anyone is, is skeptical that that language leads to that sort of thing, this is this is exactly what... Uh, this is how how doctors will interpret this language. When they look at this language, yeah. when they see... Uh, sustained life outside the womb, they can they can then put a percentage on somebody and say, oh, this is the this is the likelihood that they're going to survive past ten years old or something something like that, and then they can give a diagnosis and, and say, go ahead and kill them. Um, and so this is this is this kind of language in the bill is absurd because for one, abortion is not you should not define abortion this way. Um, you don't, it doesn't become less of a murder, less of a killing if somebody might die on their own. Like, yeah. you're still killing them. If you were to kill someone who had terminal cancer diagnosis, right. you'd still be murdering them. There's no difference between, uh, well, actually, the difference there is you probably have a better uh, guess that that person is going to die from the cancer as opposed to the child in the womb. Right. But there's no real difference between someone going and intentionally murdering someone with cancer uh, and and this. They're just trying to define it as not abortion for some reason, but it is, which is yep. which is just crazy. Like just basically trying to entirely redefine what abortion is. Yep. And in terms of definitions that are uh, crazy, let's get to section three of the bill here. This is really really wild. Um, I'm actually surprised. You know, again, there's 
we read pro-life bills and we interact with pro-life leaders a lot. That's one of the big things that we do here. And so it's hard to be surprised by how bad things are sometimes, but I'm actually legitimately surprised by how egregious this is. So Indiana current law reads, fetus for purposes of IC 60, IC 1634 and IC 164116 means an unborn child irrespective of gestational age or duration of the pregnancy. So currently that's how NDA and a law reads. A fetus is a child in the womb as we keep our coffee unspilled. <laughs> a fetus is a child in the womb at any stage of the pregnancy is present Indiana law. SB1, this bill written by Sue Glick and being championed as the, you know, the, the abortion ban that Indiana is going to go with after Rose overturned. It's changing that. It's saying that fetus no longer means an unborn child at any stage. Fetus means an unborn child, quote, throughout all stages of the fetus's development in a pregnant woman's uterus from implantation until birth. Yeah. From implantation. So what this does is now any drug that kills that embryo prior to implantation, that zygote, that embryo prior to implantation is now legal, Mm -hmm. right? It's moving the line back moving the line f- forward, allowing more abortion, de- de- defining the beginning of life more inaccurately than Indiana law presently does. Indiana law is presently good on this. Life mm-hmm. begins at conception. And we're making it worse with this bill saying, no, 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 life begins at implantation. Yeah. Crazy. And what's more, I mean, using the term fetus here is like, why are you even doing that? Fetus is a very specific gestational age and yeah. not all abortions kill a preborn fetus. They can kill blastocysts. They can kill embryos. They can right. kill zygotes. It's not, it's not constrained to that age there. Um, so even that requires a lot of redefinition. But um, just the the move to implantation, it's so it's so transparent and clear that the reason they're doing that is because they don't want to mess with things like IVF and they don't want to mess with hormonal birth control yep. because they're inconsistent and the pro life movement has not pushed them on that at all. Like they have not trying to make their politicians at all consistent. And so when a politician goes and says, oh, no, we don't want to affect hormonal birth control. No, we don't want to affect uh, uh, IVF. I- IVF, yeah. That That is just because they haven't given it a whole lot of thought in a lot of cases. And the pro-life right. movement has not forced them to think about it. And they've not made it a requirement to say, oh, yeah, you really, you really are not a good politician unless you are – viewing the preborn child as a citizen, a person in all stages of development, and you should not kill them. There should be no allowance for killing them in any case, no matter how convenient some people think hormonal birth control is. Um, It's just not something that any politician should allow. Yeah. It's evil. And on the contrary, like uh, they're one, they're not discipling politicians to view life that way from fertilization. But two, they're endorsing politicians like Sue Glick, who clearly do not believe that life begins at fertilization mm-hmm. and actively endorsing them. Um, and that is what we have with Indiana Right to Life. Now, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but Indiana Right to Life is not behind this. Bill. Right. And that's what I was just about to get to. Indiana yeah. Right to Life put a statement out on Facebook and on their website saying this bill is too weak. Now, Indiana Right to Life is a group that we've talked about and written about in the past. Indiana Right to Life has been the primary opponent of the bill to abolish abortion in Indiana, the Protection of Conception Act, which has been put forward by Representative Kurt Nisley for every year since, I believe, 2017. Indiana Right to Life has been the primary opposition. Mm-hmm. So they're, they're pro-life. They oppose, they've opposed immediate abolition for a long time. But this bill, even for them, is too weak. Even for like the weakest of weak pro-life establishment organizations, they're like, no, that this bill is a bridge too far for us. We, we don't support this. Um, and, but again, they can't really, or can they really complain? Like mm-hmm. Sue Glick is their woman. Sue Glick is their state senator who they've endorsed, who they helped get elected and reelected. This is the type of politician, the politician who wrote this, who has written this bill has been supported every step of the way in her career yeah. by Indiana right to life. And they can't be surprised. They can't be mad. Yeah. This is their creation. Yeah, and, and and someone might think, well, you know, someone, a politician can go rogue and just ignore whatever advice that, or whatever help got them to that place. But really, this isn't going rogue. This is them continuing to do the same yeah. strategic thing, strategic thing that the pro-life movement has said. The pro-life movement has told them it is okay to define a preborn child as uh, later than implantation. It is okay to 
protect a life at 20 weeks or or later. Yeah. That that is something that they've told them. And so for a uh, to take a principled stance against what they're doing here really doesn't make any sense. You lose the principles. You can't say right. you should not write into law that they're not human beings. You can't say that because your strategy has been to do that for years. Yeah. Now you can say well the purpose of it was to roll back abortion. That doesn't matter. Your principled stance is gone. It's yep. it's not there anymore. You can't say be consistent, put uh, uh, rule according to the law of God, don't allow for any babies to be murdered. You can't do that anymore because you gave that up when you did this stupid incremental strategy for decades. Yeah. And they, they can pretend that somehow they have a principled argument against it, but they don't. There's no principled argument against a politician continuing to do this if you give up the idea that politicians ought to only write into law things that are right and true and godly and ignore anyone who says that they're not allowed to do it. Um, so through your worldview out the, out the door for the last 50 years, there's just no, there's no consistency in being right. mad at this by the pro-life movement. All right. So the state of Indiana is redefining fetus to be a uh, unborn child beginning at implantation instead of at fertilization, which is currently how it's defined in Indiana law. And this bill also redefines pregnancy to mean, for purposes of IC 1634, pregnancy means the female reproductive condition of having a living fetus implanted in her uterus. So again, moving it back from conception, fertilization, to implantation. Mm -hmm. Now this follows the lead, but both of these different amendments follow the lead of pro-abortion, philosophers, pro-abortion people in the medical community who have intentionally redefined pregnancy from beginning at fertilization to beginning at implantation to protect the sorts of things that do kill human embryos, human mm -hmm. zygotes prior to implantation, right? This is, this is a switch. Like pregnancy has always been, if you have a child within you, that is what pregnancy always meant up until about 15, no more than that, up until about 25, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. when again, they met the pro aborts in the medical community and philosophical community redefined it and said, no, pregnancy begins at implantation. Yeah. Indiana pro-life Republican champion legislators are following the lead of those people in saying there is no life. There is no pregnancy until implantation. Mm -hmm. Crazy. Yeah. And evil. Yeah. And that is, I mean, that is the way that they're able to um, really dupe a whole lot of people on uh, hormonal birth control because people, yeah. people, they have not done their due diligence on this for sure, but people, for whatever reason, it is so hard for them to grasp the concept that hormonal birth control is abortifacient. Yep. And the reason that is, is because these kinds of redefinitions of pregnancy, um, saying that, yep. you know, it doesn't actually end a pregnancy. Why? Because implantation hasn't occurred. Yep. And so that's the reason that they push that line so hard. And reinforcing that is horrible education. Like it, mm -hmm. it, it is the damage that will be done by this bill just by that redefinition is crazy. You know, th this is something that people can cite decades in the future saying, oh, look, Indiana defined life this way. Indiana pro-lifers. Indiana pro-lifers. Yeah. yeah. And, and it really does set a bad precedent and you should be disgusted by this president. It, it, it should not be something that anyone should endorse. Um, it, yeah, it, it really is gross. And I think that um, if most pro-lifers who are paying attention would see this, I hope that they would start to get a little bit shaken and think, yeah, yeah. maybe I'm on the wrong side of this. Yeah. Um, I hope that you will just see that this is the, this is the logical outworking of your strategy. This yeah. is not something that should be condemned or bad because pro-lifers have adopted an unprincipled stance that is, uh, really destructive of any kind of consistent view of law. Yeah. So when we're talking about issues like this, I think the kind of pragmatic political response is kind of like, well, let's not talk about that part. Let's just take the abortions that are easier to, to take on, which are like the surgical abortions and late-term abortions and all that stuff. And let's let's not talk about, you know, the abortions that happen from abortifacient birth control or the embryos that are, that are destroyed, IVF, fertility clinics, and all those sorts of things. But the reason... Well, I mean, there's a whole bunch of reasons we can't we can't approach it with that pragmatic mindset. But one of them is, even pragmatically, the amount of human beings being killed, being murdered, in these ways at IVF clinics by abortifacient birth controls, 
is probably even more than the amount happening in abortion clinics. And even even by abortion pills, like the amount we, we don't know, like how many how many uh, embryos were not able to implant in the uterus and were flushed out and killed because the mother was taking abortifacient birth control. We have no idea. There's no way to track it. Um, but it's probably a number with the amount with the widespreadness of birth control. It's probably about the same amount as are being killed by abortion, if not more so. Mm-hmm. Um, it's the same thing with IVF. I mean, they, they throw out embryos sometimes, or or by mistake, discard embryos by the hundreds, by the thousands, mm-hmm. all at once. Um, and so these are massive, massive amounts of abortion. So you can't you can't say that abortion, you know, has been has been outlawed or that life is being protected as long as life begins at implantation. Yeah. We have tons and tons and tons of human beings created in the image of God who are being murdered in these ways. And so this is completely unacceptable. It's not as if we're just, we're getting rid of 99% of abortion and leaving a one, which would still be unacceptable, but that's not even what we're doing. We're getting rid of like half of abortions Mm -hmm. if we're saying that life begins at implantation. Mm -hmm. Um, And so this is really, really unacceptable language. Um, And I know that uh, even as we've talked about, even Indiana right to life, right? The most moderate establishment pro-life group that, that, you know, that basically that's out there, um, an affiliate of national right to life, even they, are opposing this, and I hope they're opposing it on this grounds in particular. Um, this this life beginning at implantation as opposed to fertilization. Um, mm-hmm. We need to we, we need to fight that misinformation really really hard. Yeah. So. Yeah. All right. Moving on to what do we got here? Section seven of the bill. So this is basically saying here are the the exceptions for abortion um, that we are going to be. Oh no, I'm sorry. This is not that section. This is this is a section which basically states. Um, what they plan to do about abortion clinics. Now, you would think a bill like this, the people writing this bill are writing it to get rid of abortion clinics, right? To say Planned Parenthood can no longer operate in Indiana, right, in our state. Instead, here's what they write. The State Department of Indiana shall adopt rules under IC 422 including those required under subsection A, for existing and future abortion clinics, and two, Establish procedures regarding the issuances of licenses to existing and future abortion clinics. So in the Indiana Department of State, Indiana State Department, there's still going to be a department within that department mm-hmm. over the licensing of abortion clinics. Right? We're, we're still going to possibly be giving out licenses to abortion clinics to commit murder yeah. en masse. And one of the things that they had, they had crossed out here was adopt rules under uh, IC 422.2. This is interesting just to get a look into some of the intent here. Yeah. It says, including those required under subsection A for existing and future abortion clinics that perform abortions only through the provision of an abortion-inducing inducing drug. Yeah. So in case you don't think the implantation thing relates to this, it does. I mean, they, they're, they're redefining it to be implantation, but... Really, what they're doing with it is is allowing for all kinds of medical abortions, um, and yep. and just allowing the ignorance of oh we don't know whether the implantation has occurred or not uh, to 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 be the the really the the standard practice like that's that's crossed out of the bill, <laughs> which is uh, they probably oh yeah this is a little bit too obvious but yeah that's a little bit of the intent here they don't care about uh, chemical abortions they really don't care. Yeah, as many chemical abortions as, as as you want. That's that's really the um, that's really the the state of a lot of pro lifers nowadays. They don't care about that because they are a lot of them are very ageist. Even the pro life pro lifers who think, oh no, I'm against chemical abortions. A lot of them in their behavior, they don't act like chemical abortions are that big of a deal. They'll talk yeah. about shutting down surgical abortion clinics as their goal. Like they're gonna t- they're gonna shut down all the surgical abortion clinics in our state. And yeah, we did it. Okay, but they're still getting abortion clinic or abortion pills through the mail. It, it's like right. you guys don't even it doesn't even factor in. You don't even care about it. Um, and so that is what what's happening implicitly there with those pro lifers is happening explicitly here. They are just saying exactly what a lot of uh, pro lifers' behavior would indicate that they don't really care all that much about uh, yep. chemical abortions. Yep. All right, moving on in the bill here. So here we have the exceptions. Um, so it says abortion is unlawful unless all of the of the following apply. So then it goes through a whole bunch of things. So abortion is unlawful unless the abortion 
if the abortion is a surgical abortion, that abortion is performed by a physician licensed under IC 2522.5, and then a bunch of other things. The physician has to be licensed. Um, the physician must be in the presence of the woman who takes the abortion-inducing drug. Um, all of these things. The, the woman must, uh, must file her consent with the physician. The woman submitting to the abortion has filed with her physician the written consent of her parent or legal guardian if required under Section 4. And then we get to either... The physician determines based on a reasonable medical judgment that an abortion is necessary to prevent a substantial permanent impairment of the life of the pregnant woman. Now, is substantial permanent impairment of the life of the pregnant woman defined anywhere in this bill or elsewhere in the Indiana Code? No, it's not. And so what is a substantial permanent impairment? Could that be... Raising a child for 18 years? Raising a child for 18 years. <laughs> Could that be this, um, the incredible stress? Like m my body, you know, I, I already have all this stress and anxiety. And if I take much more, my mental health is going to deteriorate. And that's going to impair my life. Like, what does this mean? It could mean basically anything. Like, who, mm -hmm. who knows? It, there's no definition of what this means. Yeah. And so this, this exception that they're putting in is going to be inevitably interpreted very, very broadly by the people who want to perform abortions, mm -hmm. and they are not directed in how to interpret this in any way. Yeah. So that's what we're going to have. You, you could very easily drive a truck through this, and this is the type of language that has been used in even Roe as yeah. the justification for all abortions. Like the, the, the life of the mother, the life and health of the mother is really a... Uh, a provision in the law that has allowed for pretty much every abortion ever. Yeah. Um, you know, because a woman can come in and say, I'm feeling really stressed about this pregnancy, or um, I might be financially ruined by this and I won't be able to raise the child or something like that. Right. Okay, we'll get you an abortion. That would be a that would be a bad for your health. We'll get you an uh, abortion. Like uh, the permanent impairment of the life of the pregnant woman is just so not clear and intentionally so not clear. I, do, I don't think, like judging from the rest of this bill, I don't think that the person who wrote this bill had the intent of making it illegal to abort your baby. Yeah. I think they intended, let's give them a broad enough exception while making pro-lifers think that we're doing the right thing. Yep. Let's give them a broad enough exception to do whatever they want. And hopefully pro-lifers will be dumb enough the pro-life movement is dumb enough to say, oh, abortion's been ended in in, in Indiana because of bills like this. Yep. And a lot of pro-lifers will go, oh, yeah, breathe the sigh of, sigh of relief. Abortion is done. No, it's not. Like, your, your, yeah. your bills are terrible. They've always been terrible. And you should have no confidence in any pro-life bill, anything that calls itself a pro-life bill. Um, you should reject that, go for abolition bills, which there are in Indiana. Support those. Don't support this. Yeah. So I, I haven't read, of course, I'm, I'm very, very familiar with Oklahoma State Code, which I've, I've, I've poured over many times for various different issues. I'm not as familiar with Indiana State Code, but I've read from people in abolitionists in Indiana that this language right here, that an abortion is necessary to prevent a substantial permanent impairment of the life of the pregnant woman, that language is not currently in Indiana State Code. There's mm -hmm. nothing like that in Indiana State Code presently. Mm -hmm. So again, this is creating new rights to a new kind of a, a new exception for abortion. And again, th this is, this is presumably up to the moment of, of birth, mm -hmm. right? Presumably that this substantial permanent impairment could occur at, at any point, or it could become apparent at any point in that pregnancy. Mm -hmm. And so again, in a way, this is expanding the right to abortion in Indiana from what currently exists in Indiana state code. Mm -hmm. Um, and so again, this bill, um, in, in in some ways it could be argued is 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 fighting abortions in some way and in but in a lot of ways this this is making it worse mm -hmm. this is making Indiana state code worse than it currently is on the issue of abortion mm -hmm. and again not being written by pro abort it's being written being written by by politicians who have been supported by Indiana right to life their entire careers yeah um, and yeah. so moving on it also includes so that includes you know exception for pr substantial permanent impairment of the life of the pregnant woman also includes exception for a pregnancy that was the result of rape or incest. So again, if the child's conceived in rape, you can murder that child up to the moment of birth. does not matter. You have that right to commit murder. Now, this part was actually amended as of yesterday, or yesterday as of the recording of this. So by the time this will air on Thursday, um, two days ago on Tuesday of this week, uh, this bill was amended in committee and passed through committee by a vote of seven to five. There was one Republican who voted against it. Um, but this bill was passed through committee, but was amended 
So the rape exception right now is, is, is complete and total throughout the whole pregnancy for anybody. It was amended to say that for people, for pregnant women who are 16 years or older, they can have abortions in the case of rape up to eight weeks. And for pregnant women who are 15 years of age or younger, you can have an abortion up to 12 weeks in the case of rape. And so, again, there's just there's this absolute aversion to just saying abortions, murder, it's illegal. Yeah. No, we have to have this exception for rape. Okay, the pro-lifers and abolitionists are all mad at us for the rape exception. Okay, we'll say there's a rape exception up to this point. Mm-hmm. right? It's like there's an absolute, um, just absolute aversion to to justice, to just yeah. speaking plainly, mm-hmm. saying abortions, murder, we're not going to allow it, even in the case of rape. Yeah. They have to carve these exceptions. They're they're uh, addicted to exceptions. They're ad- addicted to abortion. They're addicted to compromise. Mm-hmm. And in in Oklahoma, I think because of the progress of the abolitionist movement here, it has become really unpopular to to put a rape exception into your bill. Yep. Um, but a rape exception, and we've talked about this before on the Liberator, but it it is a explicit. You can kill fatherless children. Yep. And God is very clear about how we're to treat fatherless children. And these bills say, oh, in this special case where you have a fatherless child, you can kill them. Every other child, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll protect them. But if they don't have a father, if their father was a rapist, you can kill that child, which is really a repulsive thing. If there's, if, if, if there's Christians in the Indiana legislature, real Christians in the Indiana legislature, you should look at this. You should look at the word, see what it says about fatherless children, and then ask yourself how you could possibly write in that into your bill. It's disgusting. It's reprehensible, and you should be ashamed. Yeah, if you want to know what God thinks about justice and fatherless children, go read Isaiah 1, go read Amos 5, go read Jeremiah. There's specific instructions to magistrates and to to, to the people in general, establish justice for the fatherless. I mean, probably in almost half or even maybe even more than half, a majority of the cases in which God talks about justice in his word, he specifically mentions the fatherless child as being the one who needs justice to be established. And again, who is more fatherless than the child conceived in rape? Mm-hmm. Nobody. Yeah. <laughs> that, is the fa- that is the most fatherless child in our culture, and that is the child that Sue Glick and the Indiana Republicans, the Indiana pro-life politicians are saying, this is the one you can murder, right? Evil, evil, evil law that we Mm -hmm. are looking at here with SB1. Mm -hmm. All right, let's move on here. So, okay, this is a portion of law. Actually, it's it's not being added into Indiana law, but it's current Indiana law, but I just wanted to to, to make note of this. It's not being scratched, um, and it's currently in Indiana law, written, I'm sure, by pro-life politicians who are in control in Indiana. Um, and it's being restated in this bill instead of scrapped in this bill. It says, a person may not knowingly or intentionally perform a partial birth abortion unless a physician reasonably believes that performing the partial birth abortion is necessary to save the mother's life and no other medical procedure is sufficient to save the mother's life. So again, here's the like addiction to compromise. Right? And so this is stupid. So stupid. Like there's nothing else that we could do to save the mother except for give birth to this child, stab the baby in the skull, open the scissors to enlarge the wound, and then put a you know a, a, a vacuum into the child's brain and vacuum the brains out. Oh. There's nothing we could do except do that. What happens with the federal ban on partial birth abortions with this bill? Uh, yeah, it would d- it depend on how the federal ban is written. Um, in which case, they m- they may need to amend this to be in mm-hmm. in line with the with the with the, the federal ban. But in any case, the, whoever wrote this bill in the state of Indiana, here's how here's how they wrote it. So yeah. I don't know if this is being enforced in light of the, the federal ban, but here's how it was written by the Indiana pro-life politicians. Yeah. And so, just, to, just crazy. to give context, I, I've I have been to late term abortion facilities in Albuquerque where the major like a lot of late term abortions that happen throughout the country happen there. They fly women in, they stay at a hotel, the hotel has a deal with the abortionist and it's a three day procedure. Yeah. There's not going to be a case ever where a woman has a life-threatening situation and a three-day procedure is going to be what saves her. <laughs> yeah. It's not going to happen. Anyone who tells you that is stupid and ignorant and evil. Like there is absolutely no excuse for a late-term abortion in 
to save the life of the mother. It does not happen. You could do an emergency C-section. You could induce labor. There is a lot of different things that you can do. But thinking that you have to take three days to murder a child in the womb is just not the, the thing that's going to happen. If it's truly life-threatening, she needs immediate help. She needs to be at the hospital delivering the baby or having the baby induced, not kill your baby, at, spend three days in Albuquerque killing your baby. It's just not going to, that's not going to be the thing that is going to save her life. So even putting this in here is so stupid. It's reinforcing, reinforcing the pro board argument yeah. that says that late term abortions, and in this case, partial birth abortions only happen to save the life of the mother. They don't. They don't happen to save the life of the mother. People yeah. people might have a risky pregnancy, but the solution is not to kill your baby. If they have a risky pregnancy, they need to go to the hospital. They need to have uh, the, the baby induced and give give birth early, not kill your baby in the third trimester. It's it's absurd. Yeah, exactly. And the probably politicians they, they may they may come back to this and say, well, no, we're doing this knowing that you know that that's the case or whatever, knowing that no one will be ever able to take advantage of it or. Or they, they might not try to take advantage of it. But the problem is, like you said, you're reinforcing that talking point that it is necessary. And then, two, you are creating a loophole that they might be able to take advantage of. And that you as a politician, them as a, as a doctor, they will they'll may try to argue, yes, this was necessary for this, this, and this reason. And this wouldn't have saved her life for this, this, and this reason. Mm -hmm. And so putting it in there is really, really stupid and helps, the, again, the pro-abortion talking points. And you give credence to their claim that it was necessary to save the life of the mother. Like, they could say, yep. well, you put it in your own bill. If you're doubting the fact that it was yep. necessary, in my medical opinion, I'm the expert, you're not the expert. In my medical opinion, it was necessary to do a partial birth abortion on this child. Yep. And you put it in your bill that those sort of situations exist. So why are you doubting me when I tell you that it exists? Yep. It's, it's absurd. Yep. Crazy. And again, it's an addiction to compromise. They can't just say partial birth abortion is illegal. They have to nuance it to death, create loopholes. They can't just speak plainly, say abortion is murder, and you shall not do it in Indiana. All right? They're addicted to compromise. And they've been trained. Again, Indiana Right to Life can complain about the compromise and the you know the, the, the lack of, of a boldness of the pro-life politicians in their state all they want. But they have created and enabled that addiction to compromise. Yeah. That's been their strategy as well. And now they want to move faster, but no, you've tutored them to act this way in Deanna Right to Life. This is how you have trained your politicians to legislate on abortion. Mm -hmm. So this is what you get. So moving on through the bill here, we're now getting to a part that Indiana Right to Life actually would agree with in this bill, but that we do not agree with in this bill. So it reads, it is a defense to any crime involving the death of or injury to a fetus that the defendant was a pregnant woman who committed the unlawful act with the intent to terminate her pregnancy. So basically saying, as long as the person who's murdering the child with intent, specifying that even with intent, as long as that person is the mother, the pregnant woman of the fetus, she is immune from all prosecution. Mm -hmm. So again, as we've talked about in previous episodes, this leaves the door open to all the abortion you could ever want because you can go online, order pills to your door from Germany or, you know, or from, from the you know, from, from India or wherever these pills are coming from, from these different websites that are providing abortions, um, abortion medications come straight to your door. You take it without an abortionist in your state and there's no one to prosecute under this law. That's completely legal. And it's going to continue in every state with a trigger bill, any state with bills like Indiana SB one, that's going to continue completely unabated. And it's not as if people don't know about these Websites like if, if you go to a pro-abortion rally, a pro-abortion event, they're passing out these little pieces of paper with with QR codes, right, to these to these websites where you can order pills straight to your door. And again, yep. there's no one to prosecute because the pharmaceutical company is over in Asia, and the doctor who's prescribing is over in in, in Czechoslovakia or Germany or something, and the mother is immune in your bill. Yeah, and so it's completely legal. There's nothing that can be done about this. And abortion is maybe, you could maybe argue this would save a few lives, but abortion is going to continue at roughly the same rate yeah. because people can still have abortions. Well, I don't even like that language of saving a few lives. It's like, you no, know, you could have done something that does not True. allow yeah. for the abortion of any children, and you could have saved them all by that law. So you're not saving lives when you refuse to do your duty and establish justice. You're allowing children to die. Every child who yeah. dies under your bill it's now directly a result of your negligence. Yep. And so, no, you're not saving lives. You're condemning lives to death. And and just to put another, uh, we've kind of 
we've we've gone over this point a lot of a, a woman um, having a, a immunity in the bill. But one thing that is interesting about this section here is it talks about the woman committing the unlawful act with the intent to terminate her pregnancy, using that language, terminate her pregnancy. Yeah. But then they define feticide. They said subsection is not a defense to feticide. They call it feticide when it's a doctor doing it. But when it's a woman killing her own baby, it's terminate her pregnancy. Yeah. That is just crazy. Like, you you know that it's killing a child. You're defining it as killing a child when it's a physician. You're calling it feticide, which is a really scary sounding word, and that's that's good. But then when it's a woman killing her own baby, it's just terminating her pregnancy. You're just right. using pro-choice language when it comes to a woman doing it to her own child. Because you don't want to say women can be and are guilty of murdering your own child. And you don't want to treat them that way because you're most of you are cowards. Um, just to be honest, like you, you are so cowardly that you can't just say, no, we're not going to be partial. It doesn't matter what the culture says. It doesn't matter how yeah. much it defends their feminist principles. Women can and do murder their children and they should be punished when they do it. Yeah. It, it should not be that hard to do. Yeah. Um, and so moving on to the next paragraph here, it's actually interesting. They actually write, except as provided in subsection C, it is a defense to any crime involving the death of or injury to the fetus that the mother of the fetus requested that the defendant terminate her pregnancy and that the death of or injury to the fetus was the result of the defendant's termination of or attempted termination of her pregnancy. So it's even saying for the abortionist, it's a, a defense to prosecution for the abortionist that the mother requested that the abortionist terminate her pregnancy, mm -hmm. right? And But then it provides an exception. Subsection B is not a defense to performing an unlawful abortion under IC 1634-2-7. And so it's basically saying the abortionist can still perform the abortion except the abortions that are over here. And it doesn't really change much. It's still saying the abortionist can't perform all the abortions that we said they can't perform earlier on in the bill. But it's like this addiction to being like, complicated and kind of carving out loopholes and then loopholes to loopholes and all this stuff. Again, what, well, what they should deal with, like this, this, this isn't allowing for more abortion, but it's writing the bill in such a way that just makes it confusing and complicated and convoluted. And again, it's probably going to provide more loopholes and more ways that um, even in future am amendments to this that make the law convoluted on the issue of abortion. Yeah. And so what they, sh again, what they should just say very simply, abortions, murder, it's abolished in Indiana. It shall not be done. You shall not murder. Mm -hmm. It's very simple. But again, they're politicians. They, they have to write bills in these convoluted, complicated, loophole ways in providing loopholes and then like counter loopholes um, that's going to allow babies to be murdered. Yeah. Um, and that's the way that they write these bills. And that's the way they need to stop writing bills. Just, mm -hmm. just stop being, stop being ad addicted to compromising loopholes. Just plainly say abortion is murder. It's abolished in Indiana. Yeah, and there is really no there's there's no treatment of abortion as murder in any of this bill. They call feticide yeah. a level three felony. Yeah, <laughs> not not murder charges, but a level three felony. Right. Um, so there's no point in this bill where at where at all they're treating it as murder. They're just treating treating it essentially as um, medical malpractice. Like yep. nothing more than that. Yep. And, and, and that, that is nuts. And that actually was the case in this bill. This bill did not create any, any new penalties for abortionists um, from abortion at implantation um, until, until Tuesday. On Tuesday, they amended the bill to include criminal penalties for the abortionist that I believe is one to six years in a $10,000 fine. So now it's one to six years. But prior to the amendments on Tuesday, after all the pro-lifers and abolitionists in Indiana were saying – you know, how, how weak this bill was, they added a small criminal penalty. But before that, there was no criminal penalty in this bill being added to Indiana law. It just said that the abortionist loses their license. Mm -hmm. So again, it, it j is just being saying this is bad medical practice. It's not actually a crime to do any of this. Yeah. Um, and so, but that has been changed, uh, obviously, to something that is woefully insufficient, one to six years for yeah. the murder of a child in the womb, and I zero for the mom. That's Again, very, very unjust. I kind of want to have an abolitionist in that state write a bill that is an exact copy of this, but they just switch out everything for politicians in Indiana <laughs> instead of the unborn child and see how they like it. Like, yeah. oh, you guys wouldn't like these kinds of protections for yourself. Um, you just lack love. You're not 
you're a hateful person. A lot of you are hateful people. You are Damn. bigots. You treat your preborn neighbors like trash. And if someone wrote a bill like this for you, you would be appalled by it. Um, so maybe there, there's an idea. Write a bill <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah. like this. Just propose it. Don't let it go to a vote or anything like that. But I think it'd be some good headlines to to show. Hey, you guys are you guys are really inconsistent, and you would not treat yourself like this. So why are you treating preborn human beings this way? Yep. So the Indiana Republicans, they actually, they spent an insane amount of money. I remember hearing from the Indian abolitionists. I think the abolitionists and kind of abolitionist, uh, abolition bill supporting politicians in Indiana were outspent by like 22 to one or something, but by their, by their opponents who were trying to unseat them. Um, and so we actually lost our two abolitionists and abolition bill supporting legislators in Indiana. Um, but for this, this special session, it's still a special session of, of this cycle. So they're still up there. So yeah, John Jacob or Kurt Nisley may be able to <laughs> still do something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, so this bill, again, this bill, as we talked about at the beginning, is one of the first real cracks at abortion legislation post Dobbs, post the overturn of Roe versus Wade, and it is egregious. Mm-hmm. And so, um, again, we need to get out of this mindset of being addicted to compromise. There's no hiding behind Roe versus Wade. There's no hiding behind the Supreme Court anymore. Just plainly say abortion is murder. It shall be abolished. If you treat or if you if you train your politicians to write bills this way for years and years and years and even now you're still acting incrementally as indiana right to life is um in in certain ways like incrementally as far as the 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 penalties for the mom or incrementally um as far as like going after birth control and ivf and those sorts of things this is what you're going to get right we need there's no reverse way to hide behind anymore let's just write simple laws abortions murder it shall be abolished or you know life begins at conception equal protection shall be established from that point forward it's very very simple it's not hard we don't have to put all these loopholes and complicated bills referring to this section referring to this section referring to this section about all the loopholes it's very simple what the bill should look like um and that's what we need to go with yep so yep and that is the end of our time i hope uh, you guys have enjoyed this episode it's been very informative for you i hope and uh, we, we also do an art giveaway here on the program. If you are a monthly donor to Free the States, then we give away a piece of art at the end of every month. We're not giving away one this time because uh, we actually already gave one away earlier to Sam Ketcher. So um, that will uh, not be happening today. But next month, at the end of the month, we'll be giving away another piece of art, original piece by T. Russell Hunter, the T. Russell Hunter, the yeah. Russell Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you can enter to win that by uh, donating to us on a monthly basis. Really helps us out. Helps us to continue doing this work. Um, we want to we want to be influences on the culture, on pro lifers um, to abolish abortion. And there's really not a whole lot of people that are providing this kind of coverage of bills or um, or or really a lot of the stuff that the, the pro-life movement is doing. So um, if it's a, if this has been a valuable resource to you in any way, consider uh, giving and supporting us, um, regardless of how much money that is a month. We, we can use whatever you're willing to give. So You want to hear something crazy? Hmm. When we give away that art, you'll be a married man. I will, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then I will need uh, monthly donations <laughs> even more. So <laughs> there's Yes. A, there's a very compelling tie in there. Uh, yep. Yeah. So... Consider that. Anyways, um, <laughs> we appreciate your viewership. We appreciate you guys tuning in every week. This is the Liberator Podcast, where we're committed to being as harsh as truth and as uncompromising as justice. We'll see you next week. Mm-hmm.